Welcome to Theo Trade and the Weekend Update. This is Don Kaufman here, July 15, 2017. First, let's state the obvious. Markets explode to the upside and actually exceed our expected move, both in the SPX and in the QQQ. Specifically, let's get started here in the SPX. We're looking at the largest breach of expected move since we've been drawing these lines, which is I've got about 20 weeks of data right here. And really, this is the largest breach of expected move. You have to go all the way back to December 7th, which happened to be what we term a three sigma move, which is three times expected move. Uh, again, for those of you that don't necessarily tune in on a week to week basis, what these expected moves represent, okay, it's implied movement from the options market. I'll give you a perfect example here because I've already got the expected move mapped out for next week. The central line right here, well, that just happens to be where the SPX currently is. That's 24.59 and change. The expected move for this coming week, okay, is just shy of $20. That just simply means we can move up 20 bucks or minus 20 bucks. And that's just an implied move from the options chain. So if I go to the SPX and I look at Friday's expiration, what do you see? About $19.44 here, All right. So with $19.44, you just do plus $19.44, minus $19.44. And that roughly takes us just about $24.79 all the way down to about, uh, right in the neighborhood of about $24.40. Okay, so there is the expected move for, again, the coming week. I'll talk about that a bit later, but I want to make it very clear that these implied moves are to the future. They're not drawn after the fact. We draw them each Saturday and we go forward looking for the week. Now, with the expected moves, markets are supposed to stay inside the expected move about 68% of the time. That's a one standard deviation move. However, what we've actually been tracking inside of the SPX, okay, uh, and many of the markets out there is specifically with the SPX, it's staying inside of the expected move much more than statistically it should. Meaning that instead of being inside the expected move about 68% of the time, we're staying inside of about this one deviation move close to 85% of the time. However, here, this is again, and you're just looking right now at the most recent 20 weeks of data. This is the largest breach. And the irony of the largest breach is that it happens to be to the upside. So what is the breach? Now, for those of you that do tune in on a week to week basis here, I take a look at expected moves and I'm just going to back us up in time for just a moment. If you take a look right here, I'm using what's called think back. It's back data. So as I said, about every Saturday, okay, I come in and I look forward to the expected move. So I've taken us back now to July 8th. It's last Saturday and on July 8th, the expected move, okay, and that was for the July 14th was about $23. Did we move $23? Well, here's where we closed, okay? Here's where we closed actually on the July 7th, which is 24.25, okay? We actually closed this Friday at 24.59. That's approximately a, what, 34 point move. So the implied move was about 23, okay? The actual move, 34. So we blew through the expected move by about 11 bucks. Now, that's not like a shocking number, okay? It's it's an $11 move, but you do have to put in perspective, it's a $2,459 product, right? But an $11 move, really, when you start looking at this from a standard deviation standpoint, we're only expecting a $23 move, okay? We moved all right, beyond that, we're into two deviation kind of territory. So we smoke through the expected move, a $34 move. I mean, really, we, you know, about 1.5 deviations is what actually happened over here. Now, it's the SPX that, of course, catches a lot of people's attention, uh, and rightfully so. <clears throat> Let's take off all these expected moves for just a moment and look back at three years of data. So if you're not aware, <laughs> we've had an extremely large up move in really 
exploding to the upside since the lows here, and this isn't actually in early 2016, we were down at the 1800 level. We've had a straight shot from 1800 to 2459. Now, that's neither here nor there. If you track expected moves back, most of the time when we breach the expected move, it's a violent and wild move. What's interesting about this most recent break to the upside over here is it's only by $11, which again, it's very, very unusual, but it makes sense when you start looking at the cues. Now, I'm gonna bring you over to the NASDAQ because I'm also tracking expected moves inside of the NASDAQ, and this is also one of the most violent moves, and you can see from last week, and again, I'm also projecting forward. I wanna make this abundantly clear. Here, of course, is last week's data. This is this coming week's data, but I want to show you the expected move should take us right to about 140. We actually shot clear through, okay, to 142 and change on there. Now, why it's prevalent inside of the queues, okay? Well, the queues were expecting about a $2 and we'll call it 30 cent expected move. That was, again, looking back from last week, well, we're supposed to move $2. Instead, from the central point here of 138, we shot up four bucks. That is right at the cusp, okay, of making a three standard deviation move. And that's typically when we crack an expected move, that's what we see. We crack the expected move, the market flips out and actually buys into it. The cues make a lot more sense over here. Uh, again, I would like to tell you that this was the largest breach in the queues, but it wasn't. Just a few weeks ago, we actually breached to the downside, which was also okay, just uh, just shy of about a two dollar breach to the downside at the closing price over there. Anyway, again, you know, long story short, over here, if you sold premium outright this past week, you got run over. We actually used a tetrapod spread and the tetrapod spread goes out, it sells premium in the SPX. Inside of the SPX, we were not very happy in there. Um, so we sold premium in the SPX and turned around and bought premium in the queues. Buying premium in the queues offset some, but not all of the losses to the SPX. So again, the notion is if we're gonna break through the expected move, Okay, which happens from time to time. So we're going out and week to week, we're literally selling okay, these expected moves. So if it says, all right, we're supposed to move like 23 bucks, we're gonna sell a $23 expected move. If we crack outside the expected move, clearly we're gonna lose money. But on the same hand, we turn around then and we're actually buying a hedge. We're actually buying the expected move inside of the queues. Okay, and it worked to a degree the queues are a hedge. We're not doing them in as large of contract size as what we're selling, okay? But it definitely offset. All right, let's move forward a little bit and discuss overall markets over here. Let's move away from some of the statistics and expected move. But this stuff is incredibly important. Now, what I wanna look at for just a moment is what's really driving the markets at this point. So let's go ahead and turn off our expected moves for just a moment. When I say what's really driving the markets, Let's not be, you know, Captain Obvious over here, but it has a lot to do, obviously, with the NASDAQ. So I'm going to come down to a style. I've got a style already kind of prefabricated in here. And what this is, it's the QQQ versus the IWM versus the spiders. Okay. And this is something I use quite often just to kind of delineate how large, right, the move really is in the NASDAQ. And again, on top over here, all right, that happens to be the cues, and I'm using the ETFs, okay? Over here, of course, you can see the uh, the color comparison. This is our spider. Down below over here, we have our IWM. So it's pretty clear, pretty concise. This is year to date. In year to date, the QQQ is just smoking all the other products in the list by beyond double. And again, this is in percentage terms, so make no two ways about it. If you look specifically at the spiders year to date, they're up about 9%. Year to date on the Qs, okay, we're up just shy of 19%. The IWM kind of lags up about 4.5%. I bring this up to you because you realize like, all right, so it's the NASDAQ. But the NASDAQ, the market caps in the NASDAQ are so large that they're impacting, okay, the returns in the S&P. Now, 
I wanted to look deeper into this. So looking deeper into this, I'm going to kind of pull up this conglomerate symbol. When I say this conglomerate symbol, what you're looking at now happens to be Facebook plus Apple plus Microsoft plus Google plus Amazon. And the reason it says like 6.5 times, you know, 6, you know, 0.5 times, what I tried to do is I took a baseline and I've explained this a few times, but I'll just reiterate it. I took a baseline of a thousand dollars. Okay. Why a thousand bucks? Because Amazon and Google were pretty much trading at about a thousand dollars. And what I tried to do is create our own index product, but I didn't want to weight the index product, meaning I didn't put weight more weight to Apple or Microsoft or Amazon, depending upon their sheer magnitude. Okay. All I did is I took, if you take, for instance, Facebook, it says 6.5 times Facebook. Well, if you go take a look at Facebook's value right now, and we're going to do this, all right? So it's, we're going to do this. It's, uh, it's about 160. So you take Facebook and you take, it's $160 product. Okay. Times 6.5. All right equals about 1,040. So again, the weightings, I'm trying to keep them just about 1,000. Done a pretty good job of that. Uh, if you take a look again at like, you know, your Amazons over there and a, uh, you know, in Google. So here we have, again, Amazon's at 1,000. That's pretty good. Google, close enough. There's almost no, you know, again, weight one way or the other. The reason I'm doing this is I took this kind of conglomerate and I started comparing it specifically to the other indices themselves. So mm, bear with me here for just a second because this is where things are going to get a little bit crazy. So if I come over here to style and I go up here to, uh, to load style, I'm going to go right back to that same comparison chart that I was doing. Oh, excuse me for just a second as I load up my, my little comparison. Okay. What I'm doing now is I'm actually comparing the Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, you know, to the what? To ultimately the spiders in the IWM. And the reason I'm doing this, I want to show you how insane it has become that these products and these products alone, and again, we're, we're not telling you anything you probably don't know. It's these products and these products alone, though, that are driving specifically not only the S and P's, but driving the NASDAQ. Now I don't have the NASDAQ in this comparison. I could throw the Q's in here uh, as well, but I don't want to just see the overall impact, okay, of Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon isn't just astonishing. It's absolutely and outright dangerous at this point because it's driving, all right, the NASDAQ, which is up 19%, you realize almost all of those gains in the NASDAQ is predicated on these underlyings. Now, why the concern? Like, okay, this is again, Captain Obvious stuff over here. Why the concern? The concern for me comes on a number of fronts. Okay. And, and listen, am, am I ever the bear? I do maintain bearish positions. I don't want my own bearish positions to influence this conversation in any way, shape, or form. The danger that kind of lurks out there is, is one in respect to the fact that here, a uh, perfect example, I'll clear the chart and I'll go over to Google, which has earnings coming out in the near future. And you start to recognize Google, all right, it has, you know, when the earnings come out, it's looking at about a $46 expected move. But all we need is one okay, of these five products to have a three deviation move. And you think about the implications that's going to have not only to the NASDAQ, but to the S&P, it's absolutely brutal. So don't look at this as, as being bullish or bearish. At this point in time, you know, the only thing that I see is, first of all, a VIX down at 9.5. And the VIX is neither here nor there, but you have an opportunity right now and you need to recognize for the most part, you have five underlyings that are holding this entire marketplace effectively together. And I'll come back to the financials in just a moment. And the opportunity that lies out there 
is a volatility opportunity. You got to figure out ways to get long volatility and do it over the duration. You are going to have, okay, probability states that, you know, all five of these products over here, somebody could come out with bad earnings in some way, shape, or form. So throughout the course of this week, this coming week here on Theotrade, I'm going to be talking about, once again, ways to get net long volatility. And I don't mean do it necessarily in Google. I don't mean necessarily buy volatility in Apple, okay? But when you look at these five products, and yes, their volatilities are incredibly low, but yes, we realize that their earnings are coming. The really what lies out there and what we want to try to take advantage of, okay, is the fact that when you start looking at products like the SPX, and for those of you that do get a little bit into implied volatility, you look at a product like the SPX and you, again, you, you want to be very, very forward looking, you know, what can I take advantage of where there's trading opportunities and you start looking at things like implied volatility and you realize the implied volatility of the at the money options for, and here's six days, it's between five and 6%. And that the implied volatility is just, it's totally dead. It's completely and totally dead. It's five or 6% in the SPX. That's where the opportunity lies. Okay, is to get net long volatility. So, and getting net long volatility, does that have a directional bias with it? Yeah, I mean, getting long volatility means, hey, we're gonna have some volatile times in the future, but here's the key. I don't think getting long volatility, you know, six days out is gonna do it. I think we're gonna have to go out much further in time and we're gonna have to look for opportunities of duration volatility. So. Overall, okay, I'm going to reiterate a couple of things here on this kind of weekend update is, so I want to get long volatility and I've been in this stance before and it's actually paid off quite nicely in the past. Um, but getting long volatility and here we are sitting in July and you're like, oh, I don't want to buy volatility right now. Yeah, but you can't necessarily time the onset of volatility. Nobody can. Okay. Now looking purely at the VIX, that's not going to tell you all that much. You know, when people look at this and all right, it's one of the lowest readings on the VIX. In fact, it's one of the lowest closes on the VIX ever recorded, but that's neither here nor there because the VIX itself, okay, is based again in the SPX. What I'm thinking and what we're going to start to look at again this coming week on Theotrade, we're going to look at how we can actually buy buy again some duration volatility. I'm going to go out here into like October and I'm going to be buying okay, options in October and I'm going to be financing them by ultimately selling shorter duration premium. Okay, We're going to use things like calendar spreads, things like diagonal spreads. Okay, Wherever it comes down to though, the one thing I want to be is I want to be in the volatility business right now. I want to own Vega. <clears throat> and again, we just finished up our Greek week and I want to thank everybody for all the, the wonderful emails about the Greek week over here. But the Greeks are coming into play this very week when, again, <clears throat> forget about, you know, the breach to the upside. Forget about what you might think about markets. When you look at volatility, that's almost 100 days out and you recognize that you're sitting on a 12% volatility, okay? You have to step back and question like, is the future really that certain? So certain that we can't have more than a 125 point move in the S&Ps over the next 96 days? Again, nobody's really seen readings this low in volatility. And again, therein lies the best opportunity. So throughout the course of the week, we're going to talk about this. This is not just going to be buy the VXX. Absolutely not. We're going to have to use options. We're going to finance it with other options. Hope you guys can tune into Theotrade throughout the course of this week. Thank you, everybody, for joining us here on the Weekend Update. Remember, your expected moves this coming week, they're extraordinarily low. I'll reiterate once again, I started with this and I'll finish with this. The expected move for this coming week in the SPX is $19.42. It's the lowest expected moves. It's right there with the lowest expected moves ever recorded, including holiday weeks. Thanks once again. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.